Good morning, everyone. My name is Bhavisha Patel. I am a research physician at the hematology branch in NHLBI. I work with uh, Dr. Neil Young. I'm sure many of you know him, who had established a plastic anemia a laboratory bone marrow failure um, at NHLBI for many years now. So I'm part of his group. What I hope to achieve today um, is give you some updates on aplastic anemia and PNH. Is it? <laughs> no problem. Are we good? Do I have to swap the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, so to start off with, uh, some of our trials um, were uh, funded by Novartis and G GSK um, through a CRADA agreement, but otherwise I don't have any personal disclosures of conflict of interest. So many of you may know, aplastic anemia is a marrow failure syndrome that is characterized by peripheral cytopenia, often pencytopenia, that presents itself as a hypocellular marrow and hypoproliferation of uh, production. And the two main categories or ideologies how aplastic anemia occur are immune destruction um, and constitutional genetic defects. So one of the first things I want to discuss today is the distinguishing um, inherited versus acquired marrow failure is very important um, from therapeutic standpoint, but also if a bone marrow transplantation is being entertained in a patient, you need to know that they don't have inherited mutations because if a family member is being considered, they would have to be tested to make sure that they don't have the same mutation. Otherwise, the bone marrow transplantation would not serve as purpose. So for that, um, one of our colleagues um, in our lab did a very nice machine learning project. There are a lot of machine learning projects, and I think it really gives us a deeper understanding um, and allows us to look at many different variables together. So what she did was very interesting. So she put together a data set of 500 patients that were very well clinically um, annotated um, and had a diagnosis of either immune aplastic anemia or a genomic diagnosis of inherited uh, marrow failure syndrome. And what she found was um, also very interesting that telomere length, physical abnormalities, having a multisystemic disease, younger age, having a family history, having a longstanding cytopenia that was not severe, and having macrocytosis. So macrocytosis is having an elevated MCV and maybe not even cytopenia were, the, were among the top 25 variables that predicted or very accurately predicted for a diagnosis of inherited marrow failure. So what this means is this is what we do in our clinic as um, experts of aplastic anemia. These are the things that we look at. So with that, what she came up with is nice little calculator, and I put the link over there. Sometimes it functions. We're still working through the kinks. Um, it's still in development. But basically, any physician around the world can input some of these very basic um, physical and laboratory evidence that they have on their first visit and determine, okay, do I need to work this patient up further to find out whether or not they have genome underlying genetic disease? And that's very helpful, as I mentioned, for therapeutic decisions. So jumping on to the treatment approaches then, um, age and availability of donor are two major determinants of what happens to a patient as far as what first-line therapy is recommended. And there are many different algorithms that exist, but I wanted to pull one that was um, published in 2018 by Dr. Young, basically showing that any patient that, uh, so children and young adults, and the cutoff generally is less than 40 years of age, if they have a mad sibling donor, or even um, in substitution matched unrelated donor, that transplantation should be the frontline therapy. And those who do not, and those who are older than 40 years of age, um, should stand, immunosuppressive therapy is standard. And now with the FDA approval based on our trial, immunosuppression plus l pag is the standard therapy that is offered to patients here in the United States. Um, and allogeneic bone marrow transplantation is reserved if they do not respond to immunosuppression or if the disease relapses. 
So my question here, or actually in men, many forums when we discuss aplastic anemia, so where does alternative bone marrow transplantation comes, um, where does that play a role? So haploidentical bone marrow transplantation, you may have heard um, Dr. Desern on many of these uh, meetings talk about her work, um, and I'm going to present one of her latest um, publication, which looked at haploidentical bone marrow transplantation in 27 patients who were newly diagnosed. So this was the first therapy that was offered to them. And she showed excellent data. So with the platform Baltimore regimen that she uses of reduced intensity conditioning with um, augmented graft versus host disease prophylaxis, they showed um, that the rates of GVHD were very low, as you could see on the right, and that the overall survival and graft failure-free survival was also very good. Um, it went used uh, reduced intensity conditioning. And this is um, uh, as shown here with the use of 400 centigrade TBI. So I think um, with the improvement in the platforms, more and more patients will be eligible for bone marrow transplantation. But at the same time, immunosuppression is also provides pretty good outcomes as well. So as we move forward in the field of aplastic anemia, there will be a lot of patients patient discussion, and they will play a big role, active role in making a decision as to which one do I want to um, get first. Um, and we'll talk towards the end a little bit about that. So there are two upcoming trials to kind of solidify where haplotransplant fit in. Um, so I just listed them for you. There is a CURIA trial um, that looks at upfront haploidentical or unrelated bone marrow, uh, bone marrow transplant trial. And this is coming out of Hopkins. And this is reserved for the adults. And what they are trying to do is unify the conditioning regimen and GVHD prophylaxis with the Baltimore regimen for um, both of these donor subtypes. And the second trial, transit trial, is for um, uh, pediatric population, and the cutoff is uh, 25 years of age. And what this trial is, is their um, uh, extension of their phase two trial. It, this is a randomized phase three trial where they're going to be looking at uh, immunosuppression and comparing it to unrelated donor um, bone marrow transplantation trial. And hopefully with these trials, we'll have some more data to decide, you know, where all these um, different uh, therapies fit in the algorithm when we are talking to our patients. So moving on to immunosuppression. So this is what I do at the NIH, um, and this is what Dr. Young's program has been. And what I want to show you from um, uh, going from down to up is that um, the immunosuppression backbone, which is horse ATG and cyclosporin, was established to give hematologic recovery back in 1990s. And then there were a series of trials after that that were not very successful. And what the strategies that were being used were augmenting that immunosuppression because the thought was it's an immune-mediated disease. So let's augment it and see if we can get better responses. But as you could see, the next three um, did not really provide that. It was not until the addition of the L-thrombopag. So L-thrombopag is a, a thrombopoietin agonist, which um, stimulates the bone marrow. So it attacks it 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 um, it attacks the disease in a different way. And when that was added to the immunosuppression, we indeed saw that the hematologic responses were remarkably better, um, as you could see in the upwards of eighty percent. Um, and these these were significantly better than uh, when compared to horse ATG and cyclosporin alone. And recently, there was a randomized controlled trial that was um, performed in Europe um, that really showed. Uh, and uh, confirmed our findings of phase two trial that the addition of L-thrombopag resulted in better hematologic responses at six months. And indeed, the count recovery was much um, more rapid. So now that we establish, okay, adding the L-thrombopag does better at six months, what happens afterwards? And when patients get immunosuppression, we follow them for a long period of time because there is a risk of two complications, relapse of the aplastic anemia. And relapse is defined as declining in the blood counts that cannot be explained with any other underlying ideology. So patient really gets worked up for any other cause of cytopenia. And if nothing is found, we say, okay, you have relapse, re let's reinitiate um, immunosuppression or better, I think most patients are offered uh, bone marrow transplantation with alternative donor regimens, such as haploidentical 
uh, transplantation. And unfortunately, and to our surprise, the initial improvement of response did not translate into improvement of long-term outcomes. And we saw that the relapse rates were just similar to what we had observed when the L-trombopag was not used. So that still remains a problem. Good thing about relapse is that most patients are able to be rescued with a second line therapy, whatever that is, immunosuppression or transplant. And this does not impact their survival. Uh, so patients still have the same survival as if they did not relapse. So problem nuisance, it causes a lot of anxiety on the patient's part because they do have to get treatment again. And they thought that they were treated and it was behind them. What is more, so this is just um, for me to show that most of the patients do respond um, to second line therapy. And many of them become, many of them we are able to take um, uh, drugs off and they still continue to have response. What is a bigger problem is um, evolution of the disease to a myelodysplastic syndrome. And this occurs in about five to 7% of the patients who are treated with l thrombopag. And I put the definition at the top, which is basically if they have uh, poor prognostic uh, cytogenetic abnormalities or a diagnosis of myeloid malignancy based on the histology. So this is really the, the complication that really impacts the survival. I want you, I want to focus on the, uh, let me try to use this, this kind of cool. Um, on the right, uh, this Kaplan-Meier curve, you see that the high-risk evolutions are the ones who are truly myelodysplastic syndrome patients, that the survival um, is really impacted. So this is a, a grave need of improvement of this complication in patients who get treated with immunosuppressive therapy. And this is where all of our work is focused going forward. And one of the things that we have noticed over and over again, and this is true in transplant as well, so there are aplastic anemia um, has a bimodal distribution. Young patients get diagnosed with it, then there is another rise in older individuals. And unfortunately, older individuals are at risk of having more complications with immunosuppressive therapy and also more complications with bone marrow transplant. So in our um in our data set, we see that patients who are older have higher risk of relapse, and they also have high risk of clonoevolution. So the focus really is on patients who are older. Um, generally, the younger patients do well with bone marrow transplantation, have good outcomes uh, with immunosuppressive therapy as well. So um, really, there is uh, unmet need in the um, older population and improving the current regimens further. So... Um, kind of going along with the a lot of discussions that happened in the panel, one of our protocols that is ongoing right now is addressing this delay in treatment and outcomes. So the initial diagnosis for aplastic anemia, as I alluded to, there is genetic testing that needs to happen that often takes six weeks to come back. The treatments are not straightforward. If you need bone marrow transplantation, you need donor workup, you need to be at a specialized center. Um, you need to have a caretaker who can stay with you for 100 days at that center. And for immunosuppression, of course, ATG cannot be administered by all hospitals. Major centers do it, but community practitioners generally are not used to it. Oh, how do I go back? Oh. So, um, and while all of this is being figured out, there's ongoing immune destruction, right? The disease doesn't stop. Um, and as there is destruction, the stem cell pool is decreasing further and further, making the response to immunosuppression less and also making complications of neutropenia, uh, thrombocytopenia more in the early um, stages. And also, we think that the clonal evolution risk is probably higher because only a few stem cells are trying to function. So there is a lot of stress. And if there is a maladaptive mutation that gives them some advantage, that that will expand. So what is our new uh, protocol? So basically, our protocol is that anyone, once they suspect a diagnosis of aplastic anemia uh, with just peripheral blood counts and a bone marrow that is hypocellular, can start a a safe, low-risk therapy with cyclosporin and L-trombopag. And this could be a community physician in West Virginia who starts cyclosporin L-trombopag and then contacts either us or a transplant center saying, I have a patient with aplastic anemia and we need to get to standard therapy. But at least there is some therapy that has started in that process. And what I want to show you here 
is that what we see is pretty remarkable. So the patients that we enrolled on this trial had a um, oral therapy uh, a duration of only 18 days, median of 18 days, so a little over two weeks. And what we see is that there is improvement in the neutrophil counts just on oral therapy. There is a trend towards improvement in the absolute reticulocyte count, which says that there are baby red cells being uh, made, and there is decrease in the absolute lymphocyte count. And what this tells me is that maybe, in theory, and we would do some ancillary and correlative studies to prove this, that maybe the disease is somewhat halted with this therapy, and then they can go on to get the standard therapy. All of our patients went on to receive immunosuppression, but this trial is built in such that if there was transplant identified, that they could go to bone marrow transplant. So we proved that this is feasible, it is safe, and that the strategy hopefully um, could be applied once we complete the trial. And I'll present much more of this data in ASH this year. Um, once we complete this trial, that this could be the new norm. And, you know, a, a community physician could start intervening rather than just waiting and transfusing these patients. What about other TPO agonists? So um, romaplastum and avotrombopec are both being studied um, in uh, the space of aplastic anemia. Um, majority of these trials are occurring overseas. Um, they are still pretty early um, in their uh, trials. So romaplastum, there was some data presented um, in refractory setting, and it looks just as good as l -trombopac. Uh, Ava Trombopag, uh, there was uh, early uh, in combination with immunosuppression was also presented, I think last year in ASH, and they showed that um, they also observed similar uh, uh, response rate as when uh, L-Trombopag is added, but more to come as to where these would fit, you know, in relation to l -trombopag. So where are we moving? We um, recently, uh, with the use of ruxolitinib in uh, GVHD, we thought, what about in aplastic anemia? The issue with, so our major um, immunosuppression that we use currently is cyclosporin. And sometimes our patients are dependent on cyclosporin. And if you know about cyclosporin, there are toxicities that are cumulative once you're on it for a long period of time. So we said, it would be nice to have an alternative and it would be nice to have an alternative that potentially could even replace horse ATG. And ruxolitinib seems to be a very um, good at lymphodepletion. So we looked at in our well-established mouse model and the results were really good. Um, we saw that it effectively treated bone marrow failure by inhibiting T-cell infiltration and expansion of regulatory T-cells. And what the most remarkable is this Kaplan-Meier curve for survival is that all mice survived. And we know that mice work doesn't always translate into human. So we do have a protocol that is going to be opening soon, and we will be accruing patients um, in five different immune bone marrow cohorts. And basically, in this setting, what we are looking at is relapse refractory patients with aplastic anemia, moderate aplastic anemia patients who have failed one-line therapy, same thing with pure red cell aplasia, T TLGL, and hypoplastic MDS, because we think that all of these uh, diseases have underlying immune-mediated pathophysiology. There is also another drug by Regeneron um, that is currently also in trial, um, IL-2 receptor um, antibody drug, and um, uh, they are also accruing and here I would like to move to um, PNH. Um, many of you, I, I don't think um, uh, there is any changes in the pathogenesis or the diagnosis of PNH. We know that it is a clonal disease caused by somatic mutations in PNH, uh, PIG-8 gene that causes a defective GPI biosynthesis and expansion of this, these GPI deficient cells. Um, results in complement-mediated hemolytic anemia, bone marrow failure, and thrombosis. And um, I am always amazed uh, when I go to ASH as there are more and more uh, drugs that are in development for PNH, and it is wonderful for the patients to have all these options and so much activity in this field. So currently, there are three approved um, agents for PNH. Um, Ecoluzumab, I think everyone knows of. Uh, Revoluzumab is a C5 inhibitor, um, just like Ecoluzumab, but it does have a longer half-life. Uh, so the treatment is generally for maintenance given every eight weeks, which is very convenient for patients. 
And the most recent approval is Texa Techo Plan, which is a proximal blocker, um, C3. So it actually blocks intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. And it is actually a sub-Q infusion. Um, all of these agents require that there is um, vaccination given for meningococcal, pneumococcal, and H flu because there is a, risk, a small risk for infection. So here is a nice schema of where all these drugs act. So as I said, uh, ecolizumab, rabeluzumab, or C5 inhibitors, plan is a little bit proximal inhibitor. And then today, what I, what I would like to focus on um, is eptacopan, um, which is probably the next farthest in development. It's a factor B inhibitor. And let me try to use this again. It's up here. Um, really focusing on that alternative pathway, which is constitutively active. And then there was also another drug, uh, vemercopan, um, which there is some data that was also, that's being presented in various meetings. So eptacopan, what is interesting and cool about it is that it's oral drug. Um, it's given um, in the most studies, 200 milligrams twice a day. Uh, recently in um, a meeting in Europe and also uh, at ASH last year and maybe in ASH this year as well, there are various forms of data that is being presented, but there are two phase three uh, clinical trials that exist. One is a point PNH, uh, which treats patients who are treatment naive, and one is apply PNH, which treats patients who have residual anemia despite being on anti-C5 treatment. And in both of these cases, they have shown that they have met their primary endpoint, that patients do achieve, uh, majority of the patients achieve um, uh, elevation of their hemoglobin after treatment of 24 weeks, and that the, their secondary endpoint also had uh, clinically meaningful benefit. And for apply trial, they did show that there was superiority to anti-C5 treatment and that safety and efficacy was um, uh, consistent with what they showed in their other uh, phase three trial. So with that, um, what I would like to conclude is that immunosuppress uh, immunosuppressive therapy and bone marrow transplantation, and particularly the alternative um, transplantation, not just MAT-SIB, um, both of those platforms have improved significantly and remarkably over the years. And I think where the entire field is headed is where that patient inclusion and treatment decisions rather than algorithm will become more important because, you know, we heard from the panelists that we have some criteria, we have some primary endpoints, secondary endpoints, but what's missing are the practical things um, and discussions about what are, what are the risks up front um, on transplant? What are the risks with immunosuppressive therapy? Um, what are social aspects, as I discussed, you know, having the ability to move to a closer transplant center, et cetera, would need to be discussed with the patients. We really, really need to focus our research on outcomes of older patients, because this is really where we could improve further. Um, and there are many excellent PNH therapy options now, and where the field uh, probably uh, is headed is to really stratify how these all these available drugs are going to fit in patient care. Um, one of the things that could be helpful is to, you know, determining in individual patient situation, the different administration routes and frequency, oral therapy versus sub-Q versus IV, and how that may benefit one patient versus the other. So, um, Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today and uh, for being such a great audience. Happy to take any questions you may have. I think it's too early, but I think this is, um, it, I'm not a PNH expert, but all the PNH experts probably have to sit down and really, you know, determine an algorithm, uh, which would be helpful for practitioners who are not seeing these patients commonly. But I do suspect um, that the, there will be a space for each of these drugs in different situation because, because of the different route of administration. Good thing is that most of the the side effects are very similar because they all act on the complement pathways. Um, so yeah, I think it's to be determined.
Yeah. So um, I think when cyclosporin is used as the front line immunosuppressive therapy, we at NIH strongly believe that there should be every attempt made to to decrease it to maintenance dose at six months. Um, and after that, if the patient relapses, you go back on the full dose. And then the 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 strategy to decrease is very slow. We typically do it 25 milligrams monthly, but it could it really depends on what the blood counts are doing. So the second time around, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, I think Europe defers um, in strategy. They do it much slower, even in the frontline setting. But I think there are about 50% of the patients who come off cyclosporine and never need it again. So why subject them to therapy that they don't need? So our strategy is stop it, try it. If the patient relapse, we can always put them back on it. Yeah. Um, so I um, I kind of skimmed through that. Uh, let me pull that up. Let me see if I can. Yeah. So second time around, we actually don't do fast taper. Um, let me show you this. So uh, the second figure, the pie chart on the right, the cyclosporine alone, the 27 patients, you can see that we can achieve response in 93% of the patients, right? And second time, so when we use it in relapse setting, we do go very slow. We don't do fast tapers. So it's, as I said, 25 milligrams every month or two. Um, and you really, really do your taper depending on what their counts are doing. And there are patients who are very, very dependent on even a small dose. So I have patients who are on 75 milligrams of cyclosporine, which in me, I'm, in my mind, that's placebo. You know, it's such a low dose. But if you put them to 50 or if you stop them, they do have decline in the blood count. So there are a subset of patients that are cyclosporine dependent. But our goal there is that we get them to the lowest dose where it's effective and tolerated to mitigate some of the long-term toxicities. Yes. So, um, in the frontline setting, both of these drugs, the high doses are changed at six months, and maybe that's not the best strategy. And I think in my mind, um, there, sh there should have been, but that's how the protocol was written, there should have been some staggering of changes at six months. Um, but yes, and I think our trauma pack tapering is probably more important because we don't know what the long-term side effects are. We don't know how it impacts the clonal evolution. If we just look at our data in the refractory setting, the clonal evolution was much more than what we have observed in treatment naive. So there is a concern. Um, so if a patient, so on the, the second uh, pie chart are the patients who have cyclosporin and l pack when they're both on it. We try to taper the L-trombopack first, then we work on cyclosporin because we just know cyclosporin so much more. <laughs>